Do you remember the moment when Disney stopped being magical to you? Maybe it was when you were at the theme park in Orlando and it was about 100 degrees, waiting in line three hours for one ride. For me, it was when I realized Pocahontas wasn't all that it seemed. What I love most about rivers is you can't step in the same river twice. The water's always changing, always flowing. But people, I guess, can't live like that. We all must pay a price. To be safe, we lose our chance of ever knowing what's around the river. Bed. Namely, that the events of the Disney movie that many children cherished growing up was mostly fictionalized. So much so, it effectively disenfranchised the real Powhatan nation and presented a form of what Sue Hum would call a racialized gaze that was impossible for me to identify as a small child. My name is Claire Snell. This is my podcast. Its name is Disney Through a Cross-Cultural Lens. The racialized gaze, as Hum calls it, is the increasingly, quote, complicated issue of the reception and interpretation of racial identity in popular films. Some examples of popular movies that have raised this particular controversy are Mulan, for which the article she writes is focused, Lilo and Stitch, and Pocahontas, just to name a few from Disney alone. The racialized gaze of which Hum speaks is where a dominant culture, here a developed country, the United States, Western culture, almost reinvents different cultures to make them more palpable to Western consumers. This is one issue in the larger category of something we call cross-cultural discourse. This word, and the studies that come from it, aim to analyze how different cultures and contexts interact with one another and the effects those interactions can have on both parties. Let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. Did they send me daughters? And I asked for sons. In the case of Mulan, Hum tells us that, quote, the racialized gaze configures images of racial and ethnic identity as inconsequential in two ways. The first, she says, is the racialized gaze operates through the dynamic of authenticity. The politics of judging whether individuals from a culture fulfill a certain correct and even native race-related characteristics. Mulan fulfills what most Americans believe to be true of the Chinese culture in the most rudimentary sense through visuals. We are satisfied with what China, quote, is. Effectively, we are attempting to replace an entire value system in the process. Most of Mulan's tendencies in the film lean towards more that of Western values, this doesn't mean that the producers of Mulan all had these specific intentions in mind, but they knew who their consumers were and sought to cater to them a version of China that would seem most appealing. And that, Hum tells us, is the kind of China most close to Western viewers. Hum continues, quote, Second, the racialized gaze through the dynamic of universality superimposes the assumption of sameness, that is, the doctrines that all human beings are essentially alike in needs, desires, and aspirations. By this, Hom is telling us that, again, the more developed country is taking advantage of an already disadvantaged narrative by essentially whitewashing it. Quote, Even the trivial, cosmetic differences highlighted by the dynamic of authenticity are stripped away to reveal a universal white or western identity that is held in common by all white people. The racialized gaze blinds us to the differences that matter. Seeing Mulan as an imperfect cultural representation of China and of Chinese culture can get us halfway to the goals we wish to achieve. If we as an audience wish to improve the cross-cultural discourse, for starters, we want to look at the media we consume with a cognizant eye to these issues of representation. Secondly, 
and understanding is needed and that by dominating a culture or country's narrative or defining it for them, we are performing a type of cross-cultural discourse that is stagnating towards its own cause. By ignoring a country or a culture's identity, we manipulate and take advantage of an already disadvantaged group. Creating the awareness that the effects of this are not ideal, we can begin to take the first steps towards a successful and efficient cross-cultural discourse. Another movie by Disney that has these kinds of charged feeling behind it is Lilo and Stitch. When the movie was originally produced, Native Hawaiians were upset that their culture was showcased in ways that confirmed to the Western gaze, with tourist trap luau's, little to no cultural references, and a skewed version of Hawaiians in general. However, there is one moment in this movie that could possibly redeem it. This scene where older sister Lani sings Aloha Oi to Lilo. Aloha Oi Aloha Oi Ike ona ona no one fond embrace Aho ia Until we meet Well, you could interpret this as one of the most Western recognizable tourist tunes of the Hawaiian Islands. It actually has a rich history behind it. When the first queen and last monarch of Hawaii, Queen Liliuokalani, was forced to relinquish her throne to the United States in 1893, she was first confined on house arrest. She wrote Aloha Oi during this time. The title translates to Farewell to Thee. The song is widely regarded to be a symbol of and her lament to the loss of her country. As the older sister sings to Lilo at what she thinks will be their final night before social services comes to take Lilo away, there is a type of cross-cultural discourse Disney performs that it has never done previously. The older sister, Lani, is saying goodbye using a song of cultural value to them as Hawaiians and also alludes to the idea that the thing taking Lilo away is the same thing that took the nation of Hawaii away, Westerners, or, more specifically, the United States, here in the form of a literal branch of the American government itself, social services. In writing race and the difference it makes, Henry Louis Gates Jr. talks about race as a construct created by people in positions of privilege. Quote, Western writers in French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, and English have tried to mystify these rhetorical figures of race to make them natural, absolute, essential. In doing so, they have inscribed these differences as fixed and finite categories which they merely report or draw upon for authority. Again, here we see the pattern of developed countries taking control or manipulating developed countries via rhetoric and discourse. Simply through the construction of race as a definable term, the developed countries create a type of, quote, other individual or the one that is not like us. It is alienating in its basic nature. Gates agrees, saying that, quote, it takes little reflection, however, to recognize that these pseudo-scientific categories are themselves figures. Who has seen a black or red person, a white, yellow, or brown? These terms are arbitrary constructs, not reports of reality. Language is not the only medium of this often insidious tendency. It is its sign. As Gates says, quote, Current language use signifies the difference between cultures and their possession of power, spelling out the distance between subordinate and superordinate, between bondsman and lord in terms of their race. 
These usages developed simultaneously with the shaping of an economic order in which the cu cultures of color have been dominated in several important senses by Western Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman cultures and their traditions. Again, by creating this quote others in the relation to the term race, we begin to alienate others who are different from us, further pushing us away from our goal of conducting the best possible cross-cultural discourse we can especially when working internationally. However, a film from Disney that seems to try to stray away from this kind of damaging white dominated narrative of other cultures is Disney's Moana. Disney's Moana seems to be a more conscious effort to incorporate the Polynesian community into the production of the movie of the area, both for cultural value and authenticity. The film features an oceanic trust of scholarly and cultural advisors who all contributed to the movie in part, providing expertise and knowledge about cultural traditions such as wayfinding, ancient navigation, hula, and other traditions. This trust pointed out cultural inaccuracies in the film when they were presented and helped the film to become what it is to most, one of the most culturally authentic films from Disney to date. And Disney's newfound efforts are starting to pay off with Moana's domestic total gross over $248 million. And Moana is not the only example. Disney and other producers of popular media are starting to recognize the benefits of producing culturally authentic productions. At the time of release, Disney produced Black Panther earned the highest gross of any Marvel film at the time of its release. Perhaps this is indicative of a positive trend whether that motive is based in respect of people and culture, or simply motive in economics, or perhaps both, is up to you. Thank you for listening. That's all for today. My name is Claire Snell. This has been my podcast, Disney Through a Cross-Cultural Lens.